This is the Strike Mesh Boil Podcast, presented by the Merrimack Valley Homebrew Club. This week we talk beer road trips, the Doc judges a Vienna lager, and Mr. Lactose is back to talk kettle sours. Welcome back to Strike Mash Boil. I'm Marco, president of Merrimack Valley Homebrew Club, and I'm joined by my co-host, Phil. Thanks, Marco. Uh, lots to talk about this week. We've got our usual roundtable. We're going to judge some beer. And lastly, we're going to dig into quick sours. But before we get into any of that, uh, the doctor's back this week, and it was his birthday this week. So happy birthday, Nick. Thanks so much. I'm the, the big 4-0. Holy shit. You are God, the old really? one. 40? Yep. Wow! Oh man! Well, I, congratulations, I, you made it. I, I told you I'm old. We're gonna have to have we're gonna have to have you sign a waiver at meetings from now on. <laughs> yeah. uh, all right, so well, we guys, we've got a, a ton to talk about. Uh, as just mentioned, back again with us is Mixter Lactose himself, Joe, uh, and the Doc Nick. Guys, welcome back. Uh, this week's roundtable, we're uh, going to talk about beer road trips. Uh, so something that's pretty easy for us here in, in Northern Mass, uh, we've got, we're basically in one of the meccas of beer uh, in the U.S., but uh, I wanted to talk about it because uh, they can be as simple as just hopping in your car and driving to a brewery or something that you have to plan a little bit ahead for. Uh, so I'd love to hear sort of your take on um, what you guys have been doing. There's been a lot of industry that's been built around vacationing and breweries, beer visits, there's beer hotels now. There are vacations that are solely planned around going to a part of the world that is huge in the craft beer. Big trend out there right now. Curious uh, some of the things that you guys have done and, and have been thinking about. If there's a, a wish list vacation you'd love to do or uh, just some of the things that you guys have been doing to uh, get your beer fixed that's not in our backyard. Yeah, uh, sure. So uh, one of my favorite uh, beer road trips I usually do year round is going up to Portland to hit up all my favorite spots there. So that is something during, uh, you know, beginning of pandemic, you know, there wasn't really many places to go, but everyone was doing takeout. So that's kind of what I started doing a lot is heading up to Portland, uh, hitting up Bissell Brothers, Allagash, Foundation, Austin Street, Definitive, and then just, you know, stopping off at all a bunch of other random spots up there. So that that's a really nice trip to take. If say, even if you're by yourself or uh, with a friend is it, you know, kind of, so it's, it's kind of a relaxing drive to drive up there um, and then, you know, grabbing a few beers along the way and stopping, you know, take out lunch and just heading back home, you know, just a two hour smash and grab. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's kind of funny because that's like you're describing basically the day trip, right? Like oh, when you stock up, let's go for a ride. There's a you know, we know there's a bunch of places all on top of each other up in Maine that we can hit at once and grab some beers. And I'm curious, you know, about the weekend. Trip. I, I think back to, you know, I'm married. I have kids. Uh, so the beer trip thing is a little bit more complicated nowadays, right? Like the, the vacations don't revolve around my needs. But there was a time where, um, you know, there'd be a big release happening at Lawson's and we'd go and uh, we'd get a hotel and we'd stay the night before and get up at the crack ass of dawn so that we could wait in line for 14 fucking hours uh, to get, you know, two cans of beer. Long are those days gone, but I remember that was a thing. And actually, they were a ton of fun. Like you'd meet a bunch of people. You'd you'd uh have you know beers in line at six o'clock in the morning uh and you'd be freezing your ass off but you'd be shooting the shit with like-minded folks and that's when beer and and craft beer people were really cool so they were some of the best times and people used to always say when they hear like yeah i waited six hours in line for this beer that you're out of your mind like yeah but it was a ton of fun i loved it it was great and we would do it frequently i don't do it so much anymore but uh, they were a ton of fun and those were you made sort of a a weekend out of a trip versus just that go stock up run. One of my favorite trips is you can do it in a day, but it is rough. And I have done it in a single day there and back again. And that's the from Lowell to Waterbury to Stowe to Hill Farmstead and then home again. That's a long day. You are not stopping for drinks. You are grabbing some food at Pro Pig if you got time. But that is also my favorite weekend trip. And my wife is not a huge beer drinker. She will taste it and she can appreciate the you know what it tastes like but she she won't drink a lot of it but she really enjoys that that weekend trip we got our favorite b and b uh in waterbury called uh grunberg house 
Uh, we'll stay there for the weekend. It's 10 minutes to Lawson's. It's 20 minutes to Stowe to uh, the Alchemist and Von Trapp. It's about an hour to um, Hill Farmstead. Um, and it's another 45 minutes or so to Burlington. It's like right in the middle of Vermont beer Mecca. And that's that's kind of my favorite weekend trip, especially off season up there when it's, when it's not ski season, when it's not leaf peeping season. Um, that's the best time to go up there. And, and the lines aren't usually too too crazy but yeah that's that's that trip is great i don't have kids so it's easy for me marco sorry man <laughs> yeah i guess i got a few choice words here because i you know <laughs> I, I think most of us have uh joe doesn't have kids either but i think most of us have when it's come to the beer trip we've we've hopped in a car and gone somewhere there's only one asshole on this call that's uh hopped on a plane to fly somewhere just for beer and it's the guy that also doesn't have kids i think his name is phil vaunt um and hey, you know, hey, I, hey, I, that was viking luau that's the only reason i did that oh well no no i love you want that cop out mister i go to Oktoberfest in fucking germany every goddamn year oh, shit. yeah i did go to Oktoberfest once yeah 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 so, yeah so and and you know i i i uh ex- the way i've just expressed my feelings about that is in pure jealousy because if i <laughs> could I would do that trip every day of the week, but but yeah, I mean, I I think that um, you know the hopping in the car, we're we're super lucky where we live that there's so many. Like Joe mentioned, Portland, Maine. Phil, you're talking about Burlington, Vermont, or you know that area. You know the Hill Farmstead and back in one day is a is a, a nightmare of a that see that sounds just horrible to me. <laughs> and the beer's worth it, but man, that's a rough trip. Hill Farmstead alone is three hours there and three hours back. So you were talking six hours in your car car just to get beer even worse than that i think with hill farm says you got to time it right because i think they're only open like noon to five so if you want to hit stowe and waterbury there's this fine line of do you go to lawson's or do you go to alchemist because you actually can't do both if you also want to hit hill farmstead before they close if you're going to do it in a single day and you want to hit all of those all at once you're not going to burlington beer company maybe you're stopping at rock art maybe you're not von trap you're probably not going there for lunch yeah i feel like i'm like you know the folks listening don't know that we can see each other even though we're still doing this virtually uh nick shaking his head i feel like nick <laughs> is very meticulous with the beer trip like i i bet your beer trips are planned to the t you're like screw the garbage i know exactly where i'm going where what i'm getting and why i'm getting it and do, no do you have the uh multi uh multi stop or waypoint like ways laid out like no 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 but I, I it's funny that we're talking about this because we've already talked about like the if you're going to recommend like sort of the new england beer trips what are they northern vermont trip and the portland main trip right i mean those are the main two I, I can't really think of like another one. Well, where we, we do, are in Massachusetts, but, so the other one would be yeah, like Western Mass. Trillium and and Treehouse, kind of central. That's Mass. not a that sure. I I guess I don't consider that beer trip. I don't consider an hour drive a beer trip, but maybe that's just me. If you're from um, out of the state and you rent a car and you're in Boston, that's your your trip. But sure, anyway, sure, 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 sure. There, there could I be just, an argument for some Connecticut breweries now too. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking. I mean, one brewery that I really want to hit um, is um, Suarez in. Um, yeah. the uh, upper Hudson Valley. That's a little bit of a drive, and I don't know if there's really a whole lot more to hit, but I've heard amazing things from Suarez. There's a casual link to them with Hill Farm says They do a lot of um, uh, Brett Saisons and, and Pilsners and Lagers that are supposed to be really world-class. Um, but going back to your point about Vermont, um, I've done the day trip, one day trip, uh, multiple times, actually, um, because when I when I started doing that, I had a you know, a, a one-year-old at home and I, I, I didn't have time to, to do like the weekend trip. So I was doing day trips going up the same day as coming back down. And, um, Phil's absolutely right. I mean, you have to sort of pick your destinations and be very choosy about it. And generally for me, it was stop at Waterbury, pick up Alchemist, go up to Hill Farmstead, spend a couple hours there and then get in your car and drive, drive home. <laughs> uh, and that, that was, that was the trip. And you know, it's, it's worth it if you're just doing it a couple times a year. But yeah, I mean, I mean, we're very lucky that we live in in New England. I mean, there's, there, we're we're so close to so many world class breweries that it's not really even a beer trip because you can get them so easily. But the yeah, the Northern Vermont, the Portland, Maine, and I, I do want to do the the Hudson Valley at some point. And I'm not real familiar with the Connecticut breweries. I know there's a couple of good ones in Rhode Island as well. Um, but that might be something worthwhile doing at some point. Yeah, New England Brewing Company is great down yeah. there. Well, you've had New England Brewing Company. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, yeah. Hag, uh, uh, G bot can't say Gandhi bot anymore. Um, you know, it's funny because I, as, as I've gotten older, beer trips used to be a bit more spontaneous. It used to be like, all right, I want to go to Vermont this weekend. I don't really have a plan. I know I'm probably going to go to Alchemist. I know I'm probably going to Hill Farmstead, but then, you know, I'll, I'll grab my little, you know, Vermont brewers beer map. And then I'll just start finding new breweries to go to now. And and Joe, write this down. I think not Joe, uh, Phil, write this down because I think this is a future episode. We'll have to uh, bring our wives on to talk because oh, uh, boy. we now when we go on trips, it's we're going on vacation. We're there to spend time with our wives. It's not there for beer. And but we're going to try to sneak in some brewery visits uh, uh, while we're out there. So we're being kind of strategic is like, you know, influencing like. Oh, you know, I'd really love to go to Vermont. She wants to go somewhere really romantic, you know, far away from everything. And you're, you're saying to yourself, are there breweries there? Do I want it? Is that somewhere I want to go? Well, oh, wouldn't wouldn't Waterbury be really great to go to? Wouldn't oh man, downtown Burlington, Vermont is beautiful. We should go there. And then you start really being strategic about how you're doing. And then when you're there, you're like, oh, I found this really great lunch spot. It's at a brewery. You know, you're just you're being really strategic in how you're doing it. So you know, much more planful as I've gotten older. Uh, and it's less about me. How do you think I got to Oktoberfest? I mean, it was like, let's go to let's go to Bavaria. We'll spend a week there. We like we'll, we'll go in the fall. Oh, why don't we go the last week of September? You know, because it's Oktoberfest. Um, <laughs> you know, or or uh, we went to Scotland recently in uh, pre-COVID. Um, <clears throat> we're driving along through the through the Highlands of Scotland, and I knew where the brewery was. Um, but we'd been in the car for two and a half hours and we needed to get out of the car. And especially cause I was driving on the wrong side of the road and the wrong side of a fucking car. There's a brewery on the side of the road in the middle of nowhere, you know, hung a, uh, hung a right, um, a, you know, which was, uh, if I th- remember right, that's across lanes of traffic. So that was not cool. But yeah, that's basically how I do it. I, I I plan vacations with my wife, so she's happy, and then I get my my beer fix in. And the reality is, is we're not fooling any of our wives. No, like, no we're uh, not. They, they just know they have the upper hand, and they say, okay, we'll throw him this one and make him feel like he actually got away with something. But they, we're not getting anything past them. Though she she, we went to Salzburg and we we went to uh, August Steiner Beer Garden, which seats like five thousand people outside, and she said that was the highlight of our trip to Salzburg. Not all the other stuff, not the, okay, the Von, or the Von Trapp thing was probably, the Sound of Music Tour was probably her highlight, but she did really enjoy sitting out at the beer garden at, at August Steiner. She, she thought it was a blast. Anybody else notice how Phil can totally convinced himself that the beer yeah, thing yeah. was his wife's favorite? Like anybody else could <laughs> on <to> that? <laughs> See, I have the luxury that my wife loves beer almost as much as I do, so we plan our vacations around where a brewery is or where we can, you know, go to, so... Like for our anniversary, we're 15 minutes from Hill Farms, and that was purely on purpose. So here's the question. What if you are going on vacation somewhere where there isn't uh, a world-class brewery or or there are breweries that you maybe not know about? Do you plan to hit up a brewery? Do you make a beer road trip while you're on a vacation you've never been to? How do you find those spots? Well, is there anything, is there anywhere that doesn't have breweries now? Well, I mean, I will, I will point out one, so one example that came straight to my head. Um, there is a brewery there but I wouldn't call it great. So if you're taking a trip to Martha's Vineyard, okay? Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. So you know you're where right. Martha's Vineyard right? So there is a brewery there, but it's eh. So if you're on an island and you're kind of limited to what you can do, yeah, it, it's difficult. I mean, we still, I mean, I was still able to kind of check out their beers and I still had a great time. But at that point, sometimes, you know, you got to make the vacation about uh, the, the wife and, and make her happy and um, kind of put that other stuff aside. Because there's always other times where you can try and sneak in some some brewery visits or, or uh, uh, other things to um, satiate your own needs. Yeah. And, and you know what? I, um, you know, I'm similar to Joe, my wife is also a beer lover. So I've been really lucky in that regard. Honestly, kids are the ones that fucked it up. Damn. You know, <laughs> if it wasn't for kids, we'd be, we'd still be doing it. Cause we, her and I, uh, our anniversary would fall uh, right around Vermont Brewers Festival Festival every single year. So it was basically a thing. It'd be a weekend for us. We'd go away on our anniversary. We'd do the Vermont Brewers Festival. We'd hit some breweries uh, and it's something that we both really like to do. Uh, but going back to, to, you know, island life because I've, I've done some vacations where you go to these islands that don't have great breweries but there's something about the the local beer that they've accommodated to island life the climate uh, like i think about i was in 
uh, the Bahamas and they had like, um, uh, I forget the name. Now I'm forgetting the name of their, they, they have two of local Brahma. breweries. What say it again? I think it's, is it Brahma? I, 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 I've, I've been to the Bahamas. I, I, there is one beer. I, I, I forget the name exactly. Yeah, they, they have two, they have two staples, but they have a local craft brewery that opened there recently. And I'm forgetting, I'm going to forget their name too. And I'll have to look it up um, later, but, but we stumble upon it and it was great because it was sort of near where we stayed at Atlantis and it was great, but they made beers that were hot, warm climate. Uh, you know, they, they knew the audience, they knew that where they were. And even though the beers weren't that great, the vibes that you got from drinking their beer on an island, it works. Same thing with Aruba. Like I, I remember, I know Balashi beer or the Amstel Brights uh, that are just awful beers. But when you're sitting on a beach in Aruba, they're freaking amazing. Yeah, I used to travel to Hawaii for work, to Kauai specifically. There are a couple of breweries there, and it's the same thing. You, you get out of work, you go to the brewery, you're with the folks that you're working with, and you're just trying to get rid of the day. And then on the weekends, you know, you're a little more vacation mode. But yeah, it's the same thing. They're catering to a certain uh, certain clientele, and it's, is the beer great? Yeah, one of the two breweries was okay. The other was fantastic. Yeah, I mean, but that's... Uh, that's vacation beer, I think, right? Yeah. So the the and the one that I was thinking about was Pirate Republic, is a new craft brewery uh, that's in the Bahamas. You know, they're right on the Atlantis. They got a little brew pub. It's not they don't brew the beer actually there. It's just a little. It's a small plates type place, uh, tap room. Fits the atmosphere. Beers aren't awesome, but they're perfect for where you're at when you're there. You're not thinking about much else. So if the it, moral of the story. Nick, as your son gets older and you and your wife are going to go vacation somewhere, I recommend the Atlantis because you get your brewery fix while doing all the family stuff at the same time. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely keep that in mind. I'm already, you know, we've been in lockdowns for so long with COVID and I'm already, you know, trying to make plans in my head about what I'm going to do, you know, once we're all free and actually can go places. So um, definitely put that on the list. Yeah, Joe and Phil, you guys are danks, double income, no kids. I hate you both, and um, you guys can do whatever the hell you want. Yep. Well, so before we uh, finish up with that, if you're going to do back to the day trip thing, we'll do kind of a quick fire thing. Uh, what is uh, one um, number one thing you you make sure you you do or or you plan for um, on a day trip, Joe? In COVID. <laughs> in a non-COVID world. That's oh, a good question. Uh, food. Make sure make sure you're eating along the way. Yeah. Plan out a great spot for lunch. Nick, what do you got? I mean, for me, I, I, I don't mean for the long answer, but uh, I like exploring new breweries. There's so many new breweries and different ones I've never been to, beers I don't, I've never tried. So I like going to try, the tried and true places like, uh, you know, uh, Treehouse. But um, I, 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 I've been exploring a little bit more local places. And even the beer is crap. It's still fun to kind of experience something new. Marco, you got, a, you got something? Else? Yeah, well, um, I'm, I'm going to. I'll add something, but I'm going to agree with Nick. With your day trip, choose to go to the one place that you have to go to, but check to see what those little places are around there that you probably wouldn't normally go to and hit at least one of them. You might get surprised. But um, the the thing I'd say is make sure you pack a cooler. You know, I've run into this a lot of times where you're buying cold beer and you're on a three hour drive and it's in your trunk and it's 95 degrees outside and you're just cooking beer back there. So just don't forget to bring your cooler. For sure. Food, stay, stay hydrated, uh, cooler, salt pick the one that nobody said which is if you're on a day trip and you're doing a lot of driving don't drink too much get that stuff to go take it home with you have it uh have it in the safety of your own home and and not from tap room to tap room to tap room and then drive home uh half in the back all right guys uh thank you very much that was that was a great uh great talk yeah thanks guys if you like what you've been hearing on our show, hit that subscribe or follow button on your podcast service. And if you have any ideas or feedback for us, leave us a review or shoot us a DM on Instagram at Strike Mash Boil. Or join the conversation in our Facebook group, facebook.com slash groups slash MVHBC. All right, time again this for this week's beer review. Uh, each week, we're going to review a beer submitted to us by a member of the Merrimack Valley Homebrew Club or from one of our listeners. Our guest judge is going to walk through the judging process as if this were a homebrew competition. All they know is the category of the beer, which this week is 7A Vienna Lager. Now, I paused there a little bit because I had to quadruple check my notes because there, we had a little bit of a snafu the submitter was using the 2008 BJCP guidelines, and we've all been using the 2015. So if you submit a 3A 
BJCP uh, 2008, that's a check pale lager, which this is not. So uh, for those of you out there, if you are uh, submitting a beer into a comp, make sure you read the uh, competition um, rules and which uh, set of guidelines or which set of um, BJCP they're using for that comp, whether it's 08, 2015, or uh, you know, if a new version comes out in the future, um, you don't want to get into a situation where you're submitting one beer, what you think is a to a category and it's it's a it's not the right thing at all yeah and uh really quick to that point is you know we of course are going to try to do what we can to make sure that this beer is being judged correctly but in a competition they're probably not going to go through that effort to make sure that it's uh done right so uh, definitely a great tip there phil uh so back with us uh, again uh, is the doc our national bjcp certified judge nick how's it going bud good how are you but hey, listen, Vienna Lager is one of my favorite styles. I can't wait to dive into this one. So you've got the beer, uh, you've got the score sheet. Let's talk about it. Couldn't agree more. I absolutely love the style. In fact, one of the best beers I've ever brewed was a Vienna Lager. So it's it's close to my heart. It's it's fantastic. Fortunately, it's it's really hard to find nowadays. There's not a whole lot of breweries that do this, and I don't count um, what Boston Boston Adams Lager. That's not really a uh, traditional Vienna lager, but I don't want to go up Although on a tangent. I, I do like Boston lager. It is, uh, you know, Sam sure. Adams, they, they're the ones that cross me to the dark side of craft beer. So it ha- does have a you know, special place in my heart. Yeah, yeah, no knock on them, but I, I just don't really consider that one a Vienna lager, even though they state it is. So getting into the beer itself. So right off the bat, as soon as I smell it, I, I'm already detecting some issues. Uh, some flaws, some fermentation flaws. The first thing that comes up is sort of a, a artificial green apple note, which we know as acetaldehyde. So acetaldehyde is a, a common byproduct of yeast fermentation that happens uh, during the whole process of fermentation that is generally processed by the yeast into ethanol. However, if you have underpitched the beer, if you didn't oxygenate the beer, if you oxidize the beer, you can result in having some residual acetaldehyde present in the finished product. And it comes across as sort of this yeah, green apple kind of grassy note almost. And that's the first thing I get. And, and what scares me a little bit, something that can happen with acetaldehyde is lactic acid. I think it's lactic acid can actually process it into acetic acid, which can sort of create sort of this apple cider vinegar note, which I, almost sort of detected here. So that's kind of scary. I don't think it's infected, but the acetaldehyde is, is, is quite strong. I, I find it's kind of hard to get past. I don't know if, if you guys detected any other flaws in this beer so far. Yeah, for me, I'm uh, right out of the gate. And, and I, I tend to be a little bit more sensitive to this, but I get diacetyl. Um, mm-hmm. and, I, and I do get um, a bit of the green apple too. So it's almost like this sort of caramel apple, butterscotch, buttery apple, thing going on when I'm smelling it. So, so that I definitely pick up on. I, uh, you know, I think it'd be helpful, Nick, if like, because I actually, because again, I, I mentioned a little while ago, that Vienna Lager is one of my favorite beers. I find the nose of a really well-made Vienna, Vienna Lager to be pretty complex, subtle, but complex. You, you know what, you want to talk about what we should be smelling yeah. when, uh, when we're, you know, you're getting into a Vienna Lager? Absolutely. My favorite component of a Vienna Lager is sort of those toasty multi notes you get. It's very unique to sort of a combination of Pilsner and Vienna malt. Sometimes light Munich malt can kind of produce that. It's distinct from maltiness and distinct from breadiness from like something like a Pilsner. The toastiness, I I found it, I find it very unique. And I think the best part is that toastiness works really well with sort of the aroma and taste of those herbal, floral, spicy, German, European hops. And that the combination of the two is really what makes the style really shine. And it's all about balance, you know, the balance between the, the toasty malt and the, the herbal floral hoppiness. It, it's just a fantastic beer. I mean, I, I absolutely love it. Yeah, I just want a Vienna Lager right now. Like I just want <laughs> like I just want to go out and get myself a quintessential Vienna Lager and just pound liters of it. I've been meaning to brew one, but you know, schedule and all that, but uh Anyway, getting back to the beer. Uh, So, I mean, we note sort of the the issues in the aroma. So we'll just move on. The appearance itself, I mean, it it has the right color. For this style, the the color range is actually pretty variable. It can be kind of light, 
copper to more of a darker copper and this is on the lighter copper side it's a little bit hazy um it's not exactly crystal clear you kind of want to have it crystal clear for any kind of lager so that that makes me suspect that either the beer didn't go through like the diacetyl rest or it was pulled off the yeast too quickly or i mean it could be a number of issues there but that that kind of also raises a, a bit of a red flag for me so the taste itself it, it does have sort of a, a, a clean maltiness to it Again, I, I get quite a bit of apple notes. The bitterness is very low. I think there may be an issue there, uh, either with the, the the hop schedule, or, or or something is interfering with sort of that that classic German bitterness coming through. The hop flavor is also pretty muted. Um, you generally don't get a whole lot of hop flavor in the Vienna style. But there's usually a little bit there um, coming from the bitterness. This beer is confusing me a little bit. And and what I mean by that is in the aroma of the beer, I was expecting to take a sip out of a butter sandwich when I drank it. But I, I actually get almost no diacetyl in the flavor at all. And the, the green apple that was pretty prominent in the nose is, is there, but it's not as offensive as it was in the aroma. So it's actually quite drinkable considering what the aroma was, which I'm I'm... A little bit surprised at and a little confused over too. It's it's a, it's a little confusing. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think those those notes are a little bit more muted. My, I mean, my, my biggest issue though is it's dude, there's that toasty component is just really yeah. missing. I mean, there's a there's a sort of caramel sweetness which isn't very appropriate for this style that just doesn't really work for me. That along with the, like the low bitterness, it just um, it, it, it kind of falls flat. It's kind of missing those hallmark components for this style. Yeah, it, it just. So I would say, I, I totally agree. Like, I, I don't, like, I wouldn't say it's a Vienna lager. Like, if you handed this to me and, and I wasn't smelling a diacetyl or acetyl or blah, 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 whatever that word is that I can never, ever say, the green apple, um, you know, I, all that aside, if I just drank it, I'd say it's it's beer. I wouldn't even know what kind of beer it was. I would just say it's beer. It's not It's not really Vienna lager, but I, I actually wouldn't say it's a bad beer. i just say it's, it's beer, and I would drink it. And you know, not knocking my socks off, but it's not uh, something I'm going to dump. I took a couple actually big gulps of it because it's actually a pretty easy drinking beer. And once you get past some of the aromas. So, yeah, going on to mouthfeel, it's, it's pretty low carbonation. That could just be to a filling issue. Nothing too bad. It's a little light bodied. Again, that could be due to some of the other flaws that can sort of contribute to that. But just to give you some perspective, I mean, the IBUs for the style should be between, I think, 20 and 30 and not really come across that i mean maybe a little bit more carbonation you get some of that bitterness but that's really missing so yeah i mean definitely some room for improvement in this beer Uh, definitely look into um, sanitation uh, yeast pitching count making sure you're oxidizing the wort before fermentation making, making sure you're not introducing oxygen after fermentation these are all issues to kind of address to kind of improve this beer. But um, overall, I'd probably give it a, a 25. I'm looking at the classic examples of Vienna Lager, and I'm actually in the BJCP guidelines. I'm kind of surprised by some of the ones that are in here. To be honest. Like Heavy Seas Cutlass Amber Lager is an example of uh, a, a commercial example of it. I just you know wouldn't have thought would, that wouldn't have been top of mind for me, I guess. I'm not sure. I mean, I, I haven't had that in a few years. But it's been, yeah, it's been a long time. I mean, any kind of any kind of amber amber lager is really going to fit under sort of the Vienna lager, it, it, as long as it doesn't have adjuncts in it. That sort of is sort of catch all for uh, Vienna lager. Is it Von Trapp? Von Trapp that makes like a badass one. Like it's so good. Yeah, I was about to say the easiest one for us to get, or probably the better one to get, is uh, Von Trapp, and it's uh, you can get it in six pack of uh, twelve ounce cans, which usually means three of them end up in the Stein. That's what I'm fucking doing. <laughs> so I'm gonna get a six pack deck now. After this, I'm like, oh man. Yeah, my, my favorite new brewery in New England, Schilling. Uh, they do a Vienna Lager too. I forgot what it's called. Um, has some kind of nod to, to Vienna in it. Um, I, I I can't. I don't know if I actually have had that one. I mean, they make so many different types of lagers. I'd imagine it's delicious, just like their other beers. But yeah, Vienna Lagers. They're very. They're not very common. I mean, so just some real brief history. Vienna Lagers used to also encompass things like. Dos Equis Amber, sort of the Mexican Vienna lagers, but those sort of broke off once they started integrating adjuncts like like corn and rice and sort of lightened the body of those. And they no longer became really Vienna lagers and became more of something like international amber lagers, which is sort of a different style. There, there's a long history here, at least in the Americas, for the Vienna lager. Unfortunately, 
it's it's not as common as it as it used to be. Yeah, and I'm actually sitting here uh, becoming increasingly depressed after listening to this because, uh, as I said, I'm going to go tomorrow and buy a six pack of Von Trapp Vienna Lager. I'm realizing fucking tomorrow is the beginning of MVHBC's dry week. So no, I am not going to go out and buy a Vienna Lager tomorrow. I'm I'm going to actually be depressed for the next seven days because all I'm going to do is think about Vienna Lager for the next seven days. So I'm glad I set myself up for that. You can still go buy it and just tempt yourself for the next seven days. <sighs> really? You know what? That's a good idea. I can really challenge my willpower and just have it stare at me in the face every day for the next seven days. <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, I think that wraps this one up. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, we're tracking all the scores here, so we're gonna we're gonna you know announce who our uh, best of the year has been uh, for our our judging. And uh, again, listen, all the point of these segments is for us to provide some good feedback and context, just like you would get at a uh, judging table that happens in a competition. So uh, nobody should be bummed out if they didn't score the highest score. Uh, this is about constructive feedback. Uh, thank you, Nick. Uh, appreciate the time again. Uh, we'll look forward to doing this uh, again soon. All right. And now time for the main event. This week, Joe is here to talk to us about quick sours. Yet another thing he is damn good at making. Welcome back, Joe. Uh, so sour beers. Yeah. Uh, sour is one of my favorite things to make. So generally, uh, if you're starting off with a sour the way I'm going, uh, if you're starting out Something a lot of people, I think, are a little afraid to dip their toes into. You know, you're working with bacteria. People are, you know, worried to, you know, infect their other equipment. I think one of the main things you can do to start out is make sure you have separate equipment. Uh, that would always work out for you in the long run. But there's a few different methods you can use for souring that um, won't have to worry about you know, infecting your equipment that much. Yeah, Joe, time out, time out for one second. So we're talking to you about quick sour. So help me out. What the hell is a quick sour? What I know about sour beers, I've got a Solera barrel in my basement. I've got a Brett barrel in my basement. Uh, beers that are taking, you know, 12 to 18 months to do their thing. What the hell is a quick sour? So quick sour uh, is what we're going to be calling kettle soured. Uh, so this is going to be using lactobacillus, a uh, variety of different uh, strains you can use, hitting that with some pretty like warmer temperatures to get the production of lactic acid out of those bacteria and then really just killing that yeast uh, either with pasteurization or boiling and throwing in your standard beer yeast after. That'll be your traditional fast souring method in a kettle uh, you're going to be using your same brew kettle so the beer doesn't leave that that vessel uh, and then can be returned to a boil to finish off your beer. You know, I'm, I'm thinking about, I, I've had a lot of beers characterized as kettle sours. And, you know, I've had traditional lambics and goozes and, and those types of beers before. Um, really, really different. So clearly, you're not trying to create a lambic beer. Uh, when you're doing the kettle sour method. One of the things that, you know, I think about uh, for somebody who's thinking about getting into the sour game is, you know, you have to treat things a little bit different. You might need a, some some few extra pieces of equipment to accomplish um, getting a beer soured. Uh, I, I've done my lambic mashes in the past. I've done turbid mashes because you want higher proteins and, and getting stuff that's going to feed the bacteria over a long period of time. You, you, you're prepping your beers any differently when you're doing a uh, kettle sour? Generally not prepping it any differently. You really kind of want to have the same pH in your starting water, it, at least for in terms of conversion uh, and your grain. You, you could pretty much sour any beer before you're adding your hop. So you could have a sour IPA. You could, ha you could make a sour stout. You, you can do all that same thing. So the general base part of it, of prep work is going to be about the same am i crazy though or, or it could just be me it might be just a coincidence but are a lot of kettle sours have a high percentage of wheat in them most of the time generally you're working with berliner weisses is kind of one of the most popular styles so i think that's probably why you're seeing a lot of beers with wheat so even sour ipas wheat uh it has a higher protein level uh can add more body so to the end beer so I definitely see that being a proponent of why you would see a lot of these uh, beers being with wheat. You don't want a thinner, sour beer at the end. You kind of want a little bit of body to balance that out. All right. So then, uh, let, so all right. So we have some sense of uh, you know wheat might be a good idea because the protein is going to help the 
the lactic bacteria, the lactobacillus, whichever one you choose. But just talk about some of the tools of the trade, some of the things that you're going to need to get yourself uh, going with quick souring. Uh, you know, what you mentioned a little while ago is before I put you on timeout was that, um, you know, sometimes when people are, have a sour program, they have to have two sets of equipment. Kettle souring minimizes your need to do that. So, but what, but you still need a few special things to do some kettle souring. You want to talk about what that is? If you choose the right type of bacteria, you technically don't need any special equipment. So there's a lot of strains of lactobacillus that are you know, that work really good at uh, higher temperatures or work best at higher temperatures. So if you want a sour beer, uh, say Lactobacillus uh, brevis or Lactobacillus delbrecki, those strains produce lactic acid at, at, at a warmer temperature. And, you know, your standard ale temperature is 70 degrees. They're going to go, they're going to work really slowly. Uh, so it might take a lot longer to produce that lactic acid to get your you know your sour your desired sour level but there is a, a strain lactobacillus plantarum uh, that sours at room temperature so if you're a new brewer that doesn't have a heating pad uh, or something strong enough, or even insulation. You really want to keep that kettle warm. If you don't have that, that lactobacillus plantarum can sour at room temperature. It can take about two days, depending on your level of pitch, but it will sour at room temperature. So uh, depending on your level of you know equipment and desired uh, flavor, you know all those different bacteria are going to add different flavors to the beer. Lactobacillus plantarum is generally a cleaner strain. Uh, so it's one I like to work with frequently because if I don't have a free... Um, heating belt to keep my temperature generally you want to be in the like 90 to 95 degree range where those bacteria are, are really happy the 70 degree works on that strain if, if you're starting out and you don't have heating belts and you know insulation uh for your kettle it, it can be done at room temperature make sure you know which strain is going to uh, operate at the, at the desired temperature so joe uh, you you just kind of said like about two days to get to your desired level what you're really trying to do here is is lower your pH correct your wart. so pH strips or a pH meter you got to have something like that right, right? a pH meter uh, a, a lot of people start off buying really cheap pH meters you know fifteen dollars on Amazon uh, or your, your homebrew shop for a little bit more those are I, I started off with those meters and I, I really found them to be, they, they break really quickly, somewhat inaccurate. So when I first started out, I didn't know if I could trust the pH meter. I would go off my taste. You're making the beer for yourself and your friends. One of the easiest ways, if you don't have a pH meter, is to taste the beer and, you know, see it, what how sour it is. And if, if, if you like how sour it is, you can stop the process of souring by, you know, either boiling or pasteurizing the beer. But one thing to know about that method is that beer is full of sugar. So it, it's not, it, it might taste less sour than you think until the sugar is fermented out. And then that sour, that lactic acid is really going to come out more. So taste may not always be the best method if you don't do that often. Uh, yeah. So a, 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 a reliable pH meter works great if you're not so in tune with how a, a sweeter unfermented beer taste sour so an app one i go with is the apera ph meter that mm -hmm. they have a few different models i think mine was around like the 40 dollar model but then you also want to look into what style you're making uh like berliner weiss uh if you can look up the bjcb guidelines uh for a few different things and or you just the style you be around like three two or 3.1 to like 3.3 3 pH, I, I believe, is for that style. You definitely want to be checking that, and it, it can go quick on you. So kind of want to check it in your first 24 hours. It, it really depends on your pitch as well. So if you're if you're using a really high level pitch of that bacteria, it, it can sour in 24 hours. So you, you, you want to be on top of that. You don't want to walk away for a few days and come back to something that's undrinkable or going to give you an ulcer. Aren't hops uh, a bad thing for, for lacto? Right. So hops are going to inhibit the growth of the bacteria. It's going to stop what it's doing. It's a natural antiseptic. So you're going to want to make sure you're doing your standard mash. Once you mash out, you can take that liquid and that's what you're going to want to pasteurize because you don't want any of the bugs that are on the grain also be adding random flavors. It's going to start fermenting. It could ferment the, the wort. It could be adding strange flavors. It could, you could have random like strains of bacteria that 
that are, might end up being giving you those throw up type flavors, aromas. You want to make sure you pasteurize that if you're going to be doing kettle, kettle sour, either by boiling for, you know, 10, 15 minutes, or you could do a raw sour by pasteurizing at 165 degrees to ensure that, you know, you're killing any of those bugs, but you're not breaking down the DMS precursor, the, the SMM into DMS to give you that nice cream corn flavor, which happens at around 176 degrees. That's when that SMM is starts breaking down into the DMS. Uh, so if you want to pasteurize, I would recommend to 165, you know, 170 degrees. I, I, I generally keep it there around 10 minutes just to be really safe, chill it back down to the temperature of the bacteria you're using uh, and throw in my bacteria and let it sit and then you know monitor it from that a brewer who's never done this before myself included you're talking a standard mash nothing fancy there uh sparge runoff nothing fancy there right you're gonna pasteurize 160 165 uh 15 minutes 20 minutes something like that and then that's when you're gonna pitch your lacto so where are you getting your lacto what what kind of lacto are we using here so i know you said a, a strain a minute ago right. but there, there's a there's a few various yeast labs have multiple strains for a while. I mean, you can get it individual strains from, you know, White Labs has Delbrecchi, Plantarum, other strains of Lactobacillus. You, Omega has a blend of Brevis and Plantarum. I have been using a straight strain of Plantarum from uh, Good Belly. So Good Belly makes probiotics. They have a few blends, but one of their uh, capsule versions is, is pure lactoplantarum. And that's the one I would say that goes at 70 degrees at room temperature. If you just let it sit, it, it will still sour just a little bit longer than uh, at 90, 95 degrees. And that's the, the one that gives you the biggest bang for your buck as well. I believe it's $20 for 30 capsules. And I usually use two capsules in a five gallon batch and that will sour in about you know, 24 to 48 hours, you use four capsules, you're definitely, you'll get there in 24 for sure. Uh, Joe, I'm, I'm curious, the best sours in the world historically have taken years to make. Why is quick souring or kettle souring become such a trend? Is it strictly the time? For me, it's definitely the time. Uh, you're, you're making a product that it, it's clean, it's crisp, you can crank through them. And what's been going on recently is just, you know, the additives to the to the beer as well it's it's uh it, it, there's complementary flavors uh with your the lactic acid adding a nice like citrus flavor to the beer plus fruit uh, i think that's what we're seeing nowadays and no one I'm wants to worry i'm having nightmares joe i'm, I'm getting uh, it's it's creeping up on me you're making <laughs> me think about <laughs> no beer one wants to wait two years like beer all over again it's but like there. we just talked about this a couple of weeks ago right trying to crank out beer uh, as quick as you can. So this fast souring process is is really helping that along. I get the allure from uh, a production brewery's perspective, right? Um, you're not you don't have inventory that's sitting around for a long time. Uh, it's um, a more sanitary process, so you're not worrying about infecting half your brewery, which it, there's still the risk there, but it's a more controlled process. But at the home brewer level, I don't, I don't know, maybe it's... I, I could see some value in, uh, Marco, that you're creating a, a base sour, and as Joe was just saying, you're you're going to add fruit, you're going to add other extracts to it, so I mean, you could take a, say, make a 10 gallon batch and split it two ways, much like, say, dry hopping an IPA two different ways. You, you could do two different kinds of fruit, three fruits, whatever if you had the little well, and maybe there's a point cakes. of diminishing returns sure. maybe it's just maybe it's just the effort to create a traditional goose like all that additional effort isn't buying you the you know i i mean i would hate to wait two years or a year or whatever it is find out, find out it's garbage at least you know with a kettle sour you find out in maybe a week for me i i'm i'm very impatient i'm constantly checking my gravities i i recently upgraded to a tilt so i don't have to lose any liquid doing that but i i i look at my phone constantly monitoring my gravities of my beer uh so for me it's 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 uh, it's being able to turn around a beer uh, really quickly, but I want to turn around a beer quickly, but also have no off flavors. I want that beer to taste like it had been done, you know, in a standard manner, but I want, I want to get it done quick. Uh, I, I, I want to get, say I have an empty keg and I I've got all the, the base ingredients in my basement. I've got the fruit. I want to get that beer into my keg as quick as I can. If I can, this fast hour method, as long as I'm making sure that I'm not producing any off flavors in that 
process, uh, I say the quicker, the better for me. So you've, you've, uh, you've produced your, your low pH wart. You've now, now do you boil it when you're done or do you, uh, do you repasteurize it? I used to boil for about 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, but then recently based off of uh good friend, Mike Switzer's, uh, Viking Luau, his raw beer, I thought, what, why can't I do the same method with my sour? So I was doing pretty much the same method of uh, bring it to 185, but I didn't have to do any whirlpooling. So I brought it to 185 and chilled it back down. But then, you know, I was kind of noticing some, some weirder flavors with that. It wasn't as good as I liked. And then I kind of started doing a little more research of why I was kind of getting a little like corn type flavor. But based off of that, I, I, I kept it to 165, 170. A little bit of DMS, um, you think? I believe the lacto can eat that up. So I'm not sure if it's as big of a an issue. I, I really only did it like a few times. So I don't have as much insight on that because I, I really kind of changed quickly into deciding, or right, if I'm just pasteurizing it, why go higher than I need to? I So I, I kept it at one, you know, 170. Sure, sure. And then knowing it to the, I'm creating uh dms or smm is breaking down into dms at at 176 degrees i didn't want to go over that threshold so keeping it right there so nowadays i just do a quick repasteurization uh to make sure that you know it's it's not souring any more than i need to at that point is when say if you really want to you're going to be adding your hops right then um so mm, okay. I'll be, yeah, yeah. for like a fruited sour generally i, I love mosaic uh it's it's great hop. It's very much like berry, blueberry uh, aromas off of it. So I'll, I'll I'll throw in just enough for maybe like ten or fifteen IBUs worth of you know mosaic at that point. I, I don't even think you'll get that much because right. it, you're you're at 170 degrees and you're a whirlpool. You're not doing a full boil. Uh, yeah. it, it, you're basically showing a picture of hops to the uh, to the beer at that point. <laughs> you're just, you're, you're like, walking it by the grill. All right, you're throwing it in there. You're like, this is beer. Yeah. Otherwise, you're making malt liquor. Throw so, in your hops to make sure you're you're actually making beer. I, I can't think of a kettle soured beer that I've had that didn't have some sort of additive to it, meaning like it wasn't flavored in some way. I, I can't. I I literally can't think of anybody that just kettle sours boils adds a little bit of hop and then pushes it out there it's usually got something else you want to talk a little bit about you know there's a bunch of different shit that you can add to beers nowadays uh, and every company is trying to capitalize on some innovative or uh, some way to recreate a flavor as simple as possible like little extracts or those little bottles of flavorings to like the amaretti fruit, uh, fruit purees versus just frozen fruit or mashing fruit and putting it in there like what have you found to be the most successful in flavoring kettle sour beers frozen fruit i found to be my go-to uh so y- you can pretty much put anything into a a, a a sour ale base if you want to but uh frozen fruit it seems to be the most cost effective manner so raspberries for instance is one of the more potent fruits uh you can use about a i use about a pound per gallon so that method would be like freezing getting frozen raspberries thaw them puree it make sure you either bake it to repasteurize it to kill off any bugs on there or put it in a pan and heat it up to at least 165 degrees uh, because you could have some wild yeast still living on the outside of those uh, of that fruit that can re-ferment your beer uh, and cause some off flavors in it. But there, if you're not looking to uh, deal with a ton of fruit, you can always, uh, Brewer's Best makes a ton of, uh, you know, additives to your beer that actually work, taste pretty, pretty similar. You know, blueberry extract is never going to taste like blueberry. It's, it's always tastes like the candy. So you need to kind of figure out what are you looking for? Do you really want it to taste like blueberry? Or do you want to taste like blueberry candy? Because if you're looking for, you know, say, any clear blueberry beer on the market that's like produced by a large brewery is 90%. I mean, it's going to be hundred percent of the time. A, a clear blueberry beer is, is made with an extract and it's never going to taste like real blueberry. There's a, there's a ton of different, you know, Amoretti makes compounds. You can use fruit compounds. You can buy aseptic purees. Those work really well because you're, you're, you're getting, some real fruit in there, but I think the most effective in true to form flavors are going to come from real fruit that's been, you know, either pasteurized by yourself. And I think that adding that fruit as well it, to a finished beer, adding the fruit, even when it's still warm, will help extract a ton of flavor 
uh, because you're really releasing a lot of the juice from the fruit. The freezing process is bursting the cell walls, releasing even more juice from that fruit. So that's one of my favorite methods. And in a lot of your beers that I've had, it's not just fruit. You you pair it with vanilla for a lot of cases, right? I love vanilla and fruit sours, especially with strawberry. I, I sometimes vanilla can get lost uh, amongst other fruits, say like blueberry. I've I've had a really hard time getting vanilla to come through with a blueberry sours. Blueberry just dominates everything, but strawberry works really well. So for Say a five gallon batch, it's around about two vanilla beans for split five gallons. Open, or do you just toss them? Originally, I used to split my vanilla beans, scrape out all the insides, cut the skins down, and let them soak in about two ounces of vodka to make my own extract. And then I would add the entire uh, extract, including the beans and the skins, right to the fermenter and let that sit for another week. Uh, and then I would make sure that when, when I was transferring either to a keg or bottles, use some type of filter. Like I would use my stainless hop spider as like a method to like filter around my siphon. Or I would, you know, if I'm using my stainless steel conical, I'm cold crashing and it's it's dropping all to the bottom. But now what I found, and I've actually seen, I, I saw this in a video from a larger brewery, I forget which one, is they just blend the entire beans in the, uh, the vodka or whatever. It, it might not have been a vodka, but they blend everything and just add it directly. So you just throw the beans and vodka into a blender and whip it right, up into like a... a- basically like a magic bullet. Like I, I, I take my uh. mason jar and I unscrew my blender, the glass, and I put the mason jar directly onto the blender with the beans and the vodka and I blend it and I let it sit for a few days and add that directly to the uh, fermenter. And it, it, it had the exact same aroma flavor than scraping uh, and going right. through all that effort. So I, I won't go through that effort ever again. I, I guess you've uh, kind of walked through your process. W- which one is, uh, what's your what's your favorite one you make? My favorite sour is my uh, blueberry muffin. Uh, so I went to Portland, Oregon. Uh, 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 Nick is here and he, I can see him <laughs> shaking his head. <laughs> so I was in Portland, Oregon last year and I visited Great Notion Brewing. Uh, it was my last stop. I, I walked across the inte- like the whole city. It took me about a, you know a, a few hours to get from one end to the other, one portion of uh, of the city it was but i made my way to great notion and i got myself a flight of you know pastry stout new england ipa right. and of course a fruited sour uh blueberry muffin and i've never had any beer that tasted like this at all it, it tasted exactly like a blueberry muffin so i went on so a beer for somebody who doesn't like beer got it exactly yeah. yep so i went on a, a mission for months trying to recreate that flavor i tried adding jiffy mix into into the mash i tried adding actual muffins into the beer i <laughs> I, I went every road i could i I, I then I started trying. I knew it had to have been some type of extract flavor, so I started buying, you know, blueberry pie extract. All these things it just it never ended up tasting the same until a, I finally found a thread on Reddit uh, about someone who knew a, an Amoretti rep that sold a ton of a specific uh, flavor to Great Notion. Uh, hmm. So that kind of put me right on the money where it came out to be sure. tasting exactly like blueberry muffin. And so I, I make that beer at least six, seven times a year. I know there, there's some members in the club that think it's disgusting. Uh, I, I love it. So it, that's good. that's my next hour on my uh, uh, in my brew I schedule. Actually, I really enjoy that beer. I've been meaning to try and clone it, but uh, I, I know some of uh, some of the other guys. Uh, yeah, you're right. They don't like it. <laughs> I even I even got cans <laughs> shipped out here uh, to so I could compare mine side by side with it and uh, it, it was very spot on. There is I, I think eight, I was there for that vertical. Yeah, there's an eight percent alcohol, extremely cloyingly sweet beer. I think they said it finishes at like ten twenty five uh, on their gravity. So like I I have no idea what they're doing for that base beer. So mine is generally like a, a four and a half percent alcohol it finishes 
way lower, like around 1010 or 108. So <laughs> they're they're very different beers. Uh, the, I think I, the lighter version is a little more enjoyable. Yeah, for sure. All right. I think that gives some of our uh, our listeners out there a bunch of info to get started on creating their own uh, kettle sour program at home. And uh, uh, Joe, thanks for joining us. And we'll probably have to have you back and maybe we'll talk a little more on in detail on some of the uh, other methodologies of quick sours and, and whatnot. So thanks for joining us. No problem. Next week on the show, Tim and Nick join us for a rant about cold IPAs. We judge an American lager brewed with Rice Krispies. And we welcome to the show the founder of MVHBC, Mr. Matt Savage, to talk about how to start a homebrew club. Going to be a great show, so stay tuned for next week's Strike, Mash, Boil. The Strike Mash Boil podcast is produced by the Merrimack Valley Homebrew Club, an AHA sanctioned club. Follow us on Instagram at Strike Mash Boil. Join the conversation in our Facebook group, facebook.com slash groups slash MVHBC, or send us some feedback at Strike Mash Boil at MVHBC.com. Um, you know, um, uh, you know, um,